Good morning. This is Steve Stites, Chief Medical Officer at the University of Kansas Health System. We're here in the Dolph Simons Family Studio. I said it right this morning. I even got it all out. And I'm joined on my right by Dr. Hawkeye Pierce. I mean, sorry, Dr. Dana Hawkinson, our own Doc Hawk, our um, uh, Chief, uh, our Medical Director of Infection Prevention and Control. I can never get through that either. I IPAC. There you go. On my left is Dave Lisbon, who I've known since he was an intern here many years ago. Not that many. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> Dave is a, is one of our outstanding emergency room faculty. On on the uh, also here is Chris Brown. Uh, Chris is um, raise your hand. Say hi, Chris. Hello, everyone. All right, Chris is one of our outstanding hospitalists. And then on uh, the other side is Alan Greiner. Alan is the uh, medical director for Wyandotte County uh, Health Department. And this morning we wanted to talk a little bit about who's getting sick with what around COVID-19, because it's very clear that there are disparities around that. But before we go there, I wanna have a couple of special shout outs this morning. You know what, it's Nurses Week, and today is Nurses Day. You know, this is a team. And when you take care of disease, you take care of sick folks, it isn't just one person doing it. And if there's anyone on the front lines, it's our nursing staff. They're more in the rooms with individual patients than anyone here for COVID-19. So the heroes of the day and the heroes of the week and the heroes really of the moment and every day are the nursing staff here at our health system. I want to call out one person in particular. I've been working with the same nurse for 17 years. Wow. That's a long time, especially for someone to put up with me. Joyce Funk has done a great job, and as our patients will tell you, she's by far the better half of the team. In fact, most of the patients don't want to see me and she's, unless she's in the room. Because they're, not, they're afraid of what I might say that was wrong. So um, a shout out to everyone out there uh, who is such an important part of the team. So thank you very much for all you do, and thanks for the risks that you take, and, and please stay safe out there. So we turn our attention a little bit to Wyandotte County today. There are a lot of things that are going on in, in, in this world that maybe aren't always fair or don't, don't quite make sense. Talk to us a little bit about that, um, uh, if you will, David. Ted, talk, talk to a little bit about some of the things you're seeing in the emergency room and, and some of the racial disparities around COVID-19 and what it's doing in our area and around the United States. So, yeah, you know, I think um, this, as many people have said, this... <clears throat> Uh, pandemic has basically unmasked a lot of what we know is health inequities within American society, not just in healthcare. Healthcare, to some extent, represents a microcosm of some of the things we see kind of on a macro level. And I think it'd been interesting to me as I watched, I think it was April 4th or April 2nd that the Wyandotte County uh, line actually passed the Johnson County line in terms of number of positive patients. Despite Johnson County being much larger than Wyandotte in terms of population. Right. And um, the other thing that occurred was it stayed, the graph stayed parallel for a period of time. But then over the last, I would say, two weeks, I think we're up to somewhere in the number of 800 patients in Wyandotte. And right. it appears as though Johnson is semi-flattening at about 565 or something. So it's been interesting. And it's, uh, as you guys all know, it's been seen all over the country that uh, Hispanic, African-American individuals making up smaller percentages of the population still comprising a larger percentage of the COVID burden, both uh, positive test-wise as well as morbidity and mortality-wise. So um, definitely a lot of things to think about, work on, and do. So as you look at the data here at KU today, Dan, actually, well, I usually ask us, ask you what our data looks yeah. like. So how is that? And, and reflect a little bit on why would we see such a difference from an infectious disease standpoint? Yeah, I mean, again, our data today, we've had um, pretty stable numbers. I think we are looking at the new normal now, anywhere from 20 to 30 patients in the hospital. We have 30, um, 11 in the ICU. Um, why uh, is the, uh, the infection just hitting different uh, demographics? And, you know, I think that there are, there are the general um, infectious disease issues that we're seeing with how it's spread and where it's spread. But certainly we know that this seems to be hyper contagious and you, there have been different variables and different um, statistics on how easily it transfers in households. Certainly I think when you are dealing with enclosed spaces, I think that's really what we're talking about here, whether it's multiple generations of families living in households, whether it's the work situation where they're so on top of each other, um, you know, not on top of each other, but in more enclosed spaces and not able to really separate, you know, things of that nature, I think really play a part in, in all of this. 
So Chris, you've been involved with a lot of inpatients here that would have COVID-19 at KU. As you look at that, are the statistics we see reflected in the inpatients that you see, are there more African-Americans that are hospitalized with COVID-19 here at KU? Um, I think uh, statistically, I think you probably would uh, see those same things from an inpatient standpoint, um, as well as a lot of the comorbidities that are associated with um, certain outcomes. Uh, we do see a lot of that here at KU. And is it your sense that pe people are African-American, are they doing worse with the disease, the same as with the disease? I mean, how would you compare populations? I think my own personal experience, at least within our system, we've had some uh, relatively good numbers in regards to getting them out of the hospital, um, get them to rehabs. I think that uh, we do know that um, with these particular um, medical conditions and comorbidities that are associated with these individuals, um, hospital stay in length can play a part. Alan, this is a challenge for Wyandotte County, and I know you live it every day, and, and, and we talked yesterday about how hard everybody at this table and uh, on our, uh, here on our team are working. Um, I know you're working really hard with some of the things. What's the data in Wyandotte County telling you? So we, we were paying attention to the data that Dr. Lisbon mentioned where Wyandotte County passed johnson county in in terms of total cases several weeks ago and and we're really and in, in addition some of our clusters and, and outbreaks have centered on either community entities that that have a lot of minority involvement uh, whether that's a workplace or we've had several church related clusters as well in wyandotte county and so uh, we were real concerned. Several weeks ago, we actually launched a health equity task force, which has a number of community minority leaders that are playing a role in that. And we're really trying to ramp up testing in, in those groups and do as much outreach and communication as we can across the community as well. You know, so the hard question, I think, is often, is this a race issue, an ethnic issue, or is this really an economic issue that people who are living closer together who have to go to work because they're required to be at work and be in front lines and often lower paying jobs, um, that they're just more at risk in general, whether it's COVID-19 or anything else. Thoughts? What's interesting, as Chris talked about, is the underlying uh, uh, comorbidities and health conditions. Over the last week, I've been doing what, you know, doctors do as underlying geek people in science. It's kind of, you know, Are look you at all yourself this. A geek, David? I would have called you geek, too, but I would have been nicer about it. As, uh, you can you call know. me a geek. It's probably true. Most people would. Nerd. But really dork. just looking at all this actually fascinating information about um, you know, the COVID-19 virus, how it gets through cells, um, how uh, surfactant, which is one of the things that's on our lungs uh, that's used to keep them open, uh, get changed by this, and how even people with diabetes and hypertension uh, have uh, susceptibilities to the way this virus works. So really just fascinating, fascinating stuff. Like I said last time I was here, I think the issue of race is, again, if you, if you believe in the term, it's a social construct. But, but, but human beings end up finding themselves subjected to and or in different positions, in different, in different um, strata, so to speak. And with that becomes these other burdens that make uh, the ability to, to get the health care more difficult, maintain health care more difficult, uh, trust that uh, medicine sometimes is doing the right thing for them. So they're really a, a huge cacophony of issues that... That, that people who have been minoritized actually feel and are, are um, uh, working against. And so, you know, I guess to, to, to think of it in a broader context, actually, is, it, what's interesting is if you look at populations all over the world, um, Great Britain has been great about this, the stratification by income and or insurance status um, gives you some of the same kinds of pictures disparate-wise as mm -hmm. we see here with uh, certain and various minority populations and um, uh, folks who are in rural situations, uh, distance from health care on a regular basis. All of those things have a, a really interesting um, uh, part to play. And, and of course, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't say America's got its own unique uh, racial history. And anytime you talk about uh, differences, disparities, inequality, you can't leave history out of the picture. So.
Yeah, no, you really can't. So, and I would just like to say, please clarify and correct me. Um, you know, we saw, we see a lot of misinformation in, in social media, and one time it was, well, if you have a certain blood type, you're pro you're protected. That's absolutely not true. No, it's going to be that you're also worse, like a negative, which, I, which right. I am. Right, so you're either worse or you're protected, and yeah. that's not true. There was also some social media about if you're African American, you won't get the disease. Yeah, and so we are fighting this about. battle as well with, with with the misinformation. You know, at this point, there is no um, information or or study that shows that any you have any certain genetic predisposition as far as race or anything like that, or where where you're from, or um, you know what country you you live in, or what country you came from, or anything like that. So we need to make sure that. Anybody on this planet is susceptible to this disease and susceptible to illness, and it's not uh, it, it's not to one mm -hmm. particular person or genetic phenotype or blood type or anything like that. Everybody is susceptible. Yeah, and Alan, that's got to be a special. Up, oh, I hear Chris saying, "Go ahead." I'm not hearing him. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, I just I wanted, wanted to, to say, say that I. I that I agree with both Dana and uh, uh, David that, you know, when you really look at the inpatient population, regardless of race, it really does boil down to a lot of the economic factors, living arrangements, and truly what your comorbidities are, meaning lung disease, heart disease, et cetera. No matter what race you are, if you have those medical conditions, you are going to potentially have worse outcomes and worse issues in regards to the severity of the disease. Yeah, and you know what? That's so true. That's true in diabetes. That's true in cancer. That's true in heart disease, right? It, it's true up and down the line. So it shouldn't surprise us that COVID is like this. And it really addresses a, or calls out some of the underlying inequities in healthcare that we have in, in the United States. Alan, you, you probably have some thoughts around that, especially that last that sentence I just uttered. So <laughs> I'm going to ask you to uh, talk a little bit about some of the challenges that are specific to Wyandotte County. They're maybe different than the rest of the metro. Yeah, um, yeah. I think Wyandotte County is is a, a county that's a lot like other areas in the United States where you you do see a lot of these inequities. You hear people talking about the social determinants of health and how those things are affecting health outcomes. I I really do feel like uh, in our profession and with our organizations, we're more sensitive to those things than we used to be. But we haven't found great interventions yet for for how to address those issues and so i think we're going to have to work hard both with 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 the rest of this pandemic as well as into the future to try to figure out how to maximize population health and address some things that as david said have a deep historical past and really make achieving equity a, a tough challenge but but i think working together and really getting out there in the community is important for all of us to to find the right solutions and do it in partnership with the communities that are affected. Well, thank you. You, you had to know, wait, I, I'm just gonna call you up. Because you opened your computer and you closed it. Are you geeking out over some data again? Is that what you're so, doing listening? So, so yeah, you know, I think this has been, like I said, it's been fascinating as I take you know, a look at the science of it. And there is a, it, you guys, uh, the audience can Google it and look at it. It's called Health Footprint of the Coronavirus Pandemic. And I think it's very um, interesting. I have a picture of it here, but I don't know about copyright stuff, and so I don't know if we can necessarily show it. But what it, what it shows is Google that, and find it. Right, you can yeah. find it, yeah. So it talks about this first wave, this first hump, if you will, that's the immediate morbidity and mortality. You know, people like Dana struggling to, to, to work against this disease, our ICU doctors struggling to work against this disease. And that's the first hump. And then there's a second wave that talks about the impact of resource restriction on urgent non-COVID patients, right? So, so Chris Brown sees patients who we admit suspecting COVID, but really it's their congestive heart failure, it's their diabetes that's gotten out of control, and that's what actually landed them in the hospital. And then the third wave is thought to be this impact of intellectual, of, of interrupted care on chronic conditions. So we've all had to do a, a fair degree of telemedicine, uh, my colleagues in the various um, other clinics. Uh, and then this last <coughs> one is this real, this fourth wave, which is this psychic trauma, mental illness, economic injury, as well as burnout, you know. And I think my my field, emergency medicine, got a pretty hard hit. I don't know. You guys have probably heard about the the physician who uh, took her life yeah. as a perhaps as a result of having been inundated and taken care of and experienced and even got the disease herself of COVID nineteen. 
And what was chilling for us is this was a seasoned physician. You know, she was 49 years old, chair of her department. So, you know, the impact of um, this kind of devastation and this kind of um, relative helplessness for an individual is, you know, really, really kind of chilling to me. I think it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it just is a reminder of what um, everybody on the front lines from, from housekeeping to, to physicians are dealing with. So there may be some questions out there. Clarify, the physician was not here. Correct. This was in. I'm sorry. I this position was in New York. Which is your home. Which is yeah, my home. So I have a lot of yeah. <laughs> yeah. connections there. And then you yeah. might say that um, website one more time. Sure. It's not so much a. I don't know if it's a website, but if you Google health footprint of coronavirus pandemic. Um, there's a really a, a nice graph, and again, I can't, I couldn't quite figure out who deserves a credit for the the graphic, but a number of people have used it. I think it's been circulated on Twitter. I actually got it from a former resident of mine um, who is now a toxicologist. So that was there pretty you go. Cool. Well, let's turn to the media and ask if they have questions this morning, or if you all have questions. Hi, this is Melissa with Channel 41. Um, I spoke at length with a viewer yesterday who works in the, uh, the manufacturing industry um, at a business in KCK. Um, he had two questions. One, um, what can be done inside his uh, uh, business in order to keep employees safe, or what should his uh, employer be doing since they all use uh, the same equipment uh, throughout the day? And then two, uh, if you were to have uh, concerns or file once to get guidance or uh, file a complaint, is that through, I assume, the Wyandotte County Health Department? Well, Alan, I think this question is tailor-made for you. <laughs> yeah, um, as I'm sure many people can imagine, we dealt with lots of businesses while we were trying to establish what we considered essential businesses during the stay-at-home, shelter-in-place orders that have been going on for some weeks now with the phased reopening plans that we have across the Kansas City Metro. There are, there's a lot of specific guidance for different types of businesses in there. If, you, if people are interested in KCK you go, and you go to ycokck.org, there's a whole restart YCO plan there. But we will actually have guidance for businesses and employees through our 311 hotline, which is the city county government um, call in line specific questions can be answered in there and and we want we're giving guidance to employers to to do as much social distancing as they can in the workplace to provide protective equipment as much as possible to their workers to to provide hand sanitizer and deep, deep cleaning type activities especially cleaning with with tools or equipment that's reused by multiple individuals so there's there's some guidance on our website, but there'll be much deeper information if somebody like this person wanted to call our 311 line. We'll have a specific section of that that, that answers business, manufacturing, workplace questions. Yeah, it's a great question, and it is our great, the great challenge. And, and I know, Dana, you and I have talked a lot about what is the most important guidance of all the rules we have? Is it six feet, wash your hands, mm -hmm. cough in your elbow? Or is it all the above? Probably all the above. I know you're going to say all the above. I think it has to be all the above. And they are such simple messages, um, but they need to continue to be reinforced because we, you know, as people just, we need that reinforcement for most all of us. And so if we can continue to reinforce that, maybe signage, you know, putting up signs, things of that nature as well. But I think it's all of those messages. Yeah, I think my wife would say I need reinforcement frequently right. for um, uh, making the bed every morning, for example, or uh, some other things, or, you know, cleaning up after my cat this morning as I got a phone call when she's on her way to work. <laughs> and she said, I want to reinforce my message about cleaning up after the cat. Okay, thank you, dear. <laughs> All right. A clarifying question. If I wear my mask and you're in my bubble, do I still need to be six feet from you? Yeah, great question. And if question, you're Dana. outside my bubble, yeah. do I still need to be yeah. six yeah, feet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Dana. Yeah, I think, um, you know, if, if you have this bubble, and if the bubble that we're talking about is just your group of people that you have been with <laughs> during this time, um, you know, probably family. Um, you know, it just depends kind of where you're at. I, I think if you're in your home and you know this is just your family, if you only had contact with those in your family, um, I, I don't think you necessarily need to wear the face mask if you're out in public, if you're in certain places. 
um, then, then probably if you're at the grocery store, things of that nature. But if you're already in the household, you don't. If it's just relatives that that's the only people you've been with in your bubble and you know nobody else has been with anybody, then I think you're probably all safe. But we just don't know because people are having contact with people outside of their household, and that's where the real danger comes in. Yeah, and, and you know what, again, there is no absolute right or wrong to that answer, right? The problem is that it's, 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 a, it's a risk benefit answer and question that you can you have to do the best you can recognizing that every time you deviate or move further away from being 100 percent safe you just in, in, in train more risk and then you have to decide how much risk am i willing to live with and that's a reflection of your personal priorities your own health and um and how and how much risk you're just willing to take on and so i think there's no perfect answer but clear but if in i in the ideal world if you're more than six feet away you don't need a mask if you're within six feet you do need a mask that's sort of the thinking on the other hand it comes down to personal risk assessment now when you go out into public though it's a little different story because then you're giving others your risk and so i think it's one thing to say well, this is what i want to do in my home and here's how much risk i'm willing to take on it's another thing to say i'm going to go out in public and I'm going to take my risk with me. And when I take my risk with me, I have to be a little bit more thoughtful. And if I can't maintain social distance when I'm out in public, then I think you should wear a mask. I think that's a matter of personal responsibility. And, and, and I think we have to remember that as we open up society, it won't be perfect. We expect more COVID-19 illness to be in the hospital. We expect more coronavirus to be infecting other people. That's part of the price we pay to open up our society. And that's what's kept us at, that's why it's been such a long discussion. You see all the debate. It, it, we are going to have more corona, uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 patients in this hospital and around the community as we open it up. The way we try to mitigate that, the way we try to slow it down, is really through our personal responsibility. And Alan, I know that's got to be part of the equation that you guys have been talking about in the health department. Yeah, absolutely. A big part of what we are trying to do is is educate and and as Dana mentioned, just reinforce the messages. We we have another little website called covidcommitmentpledge.com where people can go in there and and pledge to follow some of these social responsibility behaviors that, you know, we all know we're supposed to be doing these things, but again, it's it's that reinforcement and we we need to change the social norms in society going forward. And so in public health, we'll be working hard at that and hope that it pays off and, and that we don't see see a big uptick in, in all the bad outcomes that we know are possible. I'm gonna to turn to Chris. So Chris, this is a philosophical question I want to ask, and it's, it's a, I may not even ask it very well, but I think it's important. So for many of us, or many people who haven't seen the devastating outcome of COVID-19, we're not in New York City, right? Kansas City has bent the curve, the metropolitan area, we've done great. But there are sick folks that have been affected. You've been taking care of them. What do you think the message that those patients would want to give, if they could, to everyone else who hasn't had the disease? Um, I think it would be essentially what you just said and what you've been outlining for weeks and weeks, to, for weeks and weeks. Um, I think social distancing um, and really being selfless is not about the risk that you're willing to take within your own home, in your own personal life. It really can affect people who are at risk, which we all know, but also those individuals who are presumed healthy that now come into our hospital system and they now are finding out that they have medical conditions that they had not previously been diagnosed with, which could potentially make their hospitalization um, longer. It puts them at risk for a lot of these complications that you do see in the media and possible transfer to the ICU. So I think that they would probably say to the public, we need to be selfless. We need to be thoughtful about what we do and what our actions can house, can then therefore affect them and others. Yeah, it is just so important, isn't it? Other questions? I think so. I have a question. Judy, she's 70 years old. She wants you to know she watches every morning and she thanks you. She has two questions. One of them is she's scheduled for a repair person to come and fix her AC. She stayed in her bubble. Is it safe to open her door to the air conditioning person? Dana, what do you think? I'm thinking if you got to get something fixed, it's still okay. Maintain your six feet. Yeah, maintain your six feet. You know, wear a mask. Wipe up likely, behind. Likely, uh, you know, the 
employers around the city now are having their employees wear masks. So I think if if both people wear masks while they're there, um, I think that that's perfectly fine and safe. You know, typically um, when people come into work on your home, they they go from the front door to the room they have to go work in. That should be safe as far as any contamination in the environment. Uh, but in, in general, I think that's going to be a pretty safe safe thing if you can maintain your distance, basically. Yeah. Her second part of her question, me, I'm sorry, maybe a little bit tougher, and maybe not, but she said, what is your bubble? She said her family's bubble is mom, dad, and her three grandchildren. One of the grandchildren got called back to work. Now he's outside the bubble for 25% of his time. Yeah. So Dana, that, that again, it, how much risk are you yeah. willing to in, entertain yeah. in your life is yeah. the question for that. And yeah. what's your underlying health like? I mean, if you're healthy and someone has to go out to work, okay. I mean, my wife and I work every day, but we come home and we're, I think we're in each other's bubble still. So, right. um, but after the cat this morning, I don't know. <laughs> but but, but well, what do you think about the, uh, the question? I think that, yeah, again, it, it goes to risk assessment. You know, this grandchild that's going to work, are they taking all of the precautions that they can. If there's wearing a mask, if it's not touching your face, if it's frequent hand hygiene, you know, if that person's protecting themselves, that risk goes down. If they're not doing those things, then that risk goes up. And it's, um, it, it's, it gets difficult and we have millions of scenarios because families want to see each other, loved ones want to see each other. But those are things that you just have to continue to, to evaluate do what you can on, on, on your own uh, behalf, you know, do the hand hygiene, don't touch your face. You know, if, if other family members are ill or having symptoms, get those evaluated. And those are just things that you have to be doing just on, on a and daily it's a basis. It's a personal choice. So Dave, you've got three beautiful children and your wife, Eleanor. Um, you guys have been married for approximately a very long time, almost as long as we have, I think. And yeah. so um, are your kids in your bubble or outside your bubble? And I know that some of them aren't in Kansas City and some are. So uh, they're in my bubble. I'll give a shout out to my son who's home from law school, completing his stuff online, Paul Lisbon, Howard University. Uh, uh, Class of? I guess it'll be 2021. Okay. Everything looks like it's going well. Um, so the answer to that is he is an individual who's been taking extraordinary care. He's been chiding my, me for being going out to the store. And it's like, Dad, you've been out twice in three days. Why are you out? So uh, uh, he's definitely in our bubble. He's maintaining everything he, he can to do, the, the social distancing. Um, uh, our other two children are actually uh, in Washington, D.C. They may be coming home for a few, but they've, uh, they're engaged in occupations that are I, still considered um, uh, integral, so they, they're still working. So but. when they come home, are you going to isolate them? Well, one of them, actually, the other son, is uh, he came home from London. He has twins, by the way. The two boys are twins. <laughs> yeah, so my son from London came home and quarantined in his brother's house, uh, brother's apartment, rather, in Washington, D.C. for a couple of weeks. While your brother was here. <laughs> well, while here. his brother was here, yeah. It's pretty. That's called f familial. Yeah, living, it's called um, uh, utilizing finances wisely. <laughs> <laughs> and I would like to say, too, you know, as when Wuhan released some of their restrictions, when South Korea released some of their restrictions, Italy, you know, we do have an opening, and as you have a further opening, those bubbles are going to break down. You know, just as soon as they released their restrictions, people weren't rushing out into the street. They were still cautious and timid about doing it. But eventually, as we move further into this, depending what stage we are of the reopening, whether we're uh, red, yellow, or green, or the way we, if we can go back, if we have to go back to sheltering place, you know, those bubbles will break down eventually. And so that's the thing to remember as well. Hopefully, we continue to progress in, in a good manner for the reopening, but we have to wait for that as well. Chris, what do you think is maybe the most heartbreaking story you've seen related to COVID-19 in, in one of your patients? Or mm. not, it's one of the hardest <laughs> ones. Uh, I probably would say that's a tough one. I think all of them potentially could be heartbreaking. Um, but I would probably say I had a patient who I was taking care of, and one of the things that I do always ask about their family members and the individuals who are at home just to make sure they're doing well. And um, one of the patients, significant other, had not been doing well. And I subsequently had to get on the phone with uh, their one of their children and then have them transferred to KU via EMS. And then I would say within about 40 to 72 hours, I think um, they did not do well and expired for whatever reason, complications within ICU. 
Um, and I think that was probably one of the most heartbreaking ones. Um, if I, 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 I'll probably just say that. But I mean, at the end of the day, I've had several, several difficult cases. Um, you know, you really do get a chance to know the families because you have to spend a lot of time outside of the patient rooms, communicating with them, giving them updates, having to assist them with their emotional needs. So I think overall, uh, it all could be very emotional, uh, daunting. But that was probably one of the, my most uh, difficult cases. And have you, you're, because patients can't come in, the, the families, visitors can't come in the hospital. So a lot of your time is spent on the phone communicating with families because they can't come see their loved one. Correct, correct. Other questions from the media? Uh, this is Jim Brabish at Kansas City Medicine. I was wondering, and particularly in Wyandotte County, what is the extent of undetected cases? Uh, do you feel like you're, the testing is catching it, or are there uh, people out there that, that were missing, like has it occurred in other uh, cities, such as New York? Alan, I know we're not getting all of it. We just know I mean, there's no way, because we haven't had enough testing for so long. No, it's it's really been a challenge, and, and as you know, Dr. Stites, we've worked hard to ramp up testing. In fact, I was just looking at a, a flyer. We've got a testing event with free testing this afternoon, 3 to 6 p.m. down in Argentina at the Argentine Library. So if you live in Kansas City, Kansas, and you have any symptoms at all, we are now testing people that, that have even the most minor symptoms like headaches, sore throat, fatigue. But we, we think there's at least 10 times the cases of, of COVID out there that than what we've detected. It, it, it probably is even more than that. Uh, for a while, we were, we were having people self-report symptoms on our website. We're actually about to shut that down this week because it's kind of dropped off. But, but we've really been trying to build trust in, in the community because we're a little concerned that there are people who just don't want to get tested at all, even if they have some mild symptoms, uh, because they're, they're afraid that somehow that's going to get them reported or, or somehow have, having to do something different with their employer. So it's really been a challenge, and, and we're going to keep working hard to pump up the testing as much as we can. Well, and Wyandotte does have a large immigrant population, and that's got to be especially terrifying to people to think, oh, I'll be discovered and, and, and deported or whatever. So that just adds, I think, to some of the public health risks, do you think? Abs absolutely it does. Um, so we've been trying to do things in multiple languages, including for, for some of the refugee populations. We've had a number of Wyandotte County residents that worked in the meatpacking plant up in St. Joe that were affected. So we've been getting stuff translated into Burmese and, and Nepali and other languages as well. Um, and, and we're going to keep having to do that. Uh, it, we get, we'll have to probably put out different kinds of videos and, and social media as well. So all that stuff we're trying to keep pushing forward. Yeah, and I'm not sure our, uh, everyone in our listening audience will know how wonderfully diverse Wyandotte is. I mean, it really is a remarkable story of one of the most diverse places in the United States. Other questions? Yes, I've got uh, a couple here that uh, I, one of them I'm going to ask and we can kind of think about it. And then the other one I think is a little bit more straightforward. Um, but the first one is the necessity is the mother of invention. What policies, logistics, or practices has the health system taken on that has worked so well uh, it will keep after the pandemic is over? And the other question is, have you seen any rate of readmission after discharge? Well, let me go to our uh, folks who are on the front lines and say, have you, I'm going to take that one first, and I'll come back, circle back to the first one. Um, readmissions after discharges. A patient's coming back. Dan, I know we've had a one or two. Yeah, and certainly um, Dr. Brown and I have had the uh, luxury and, and, and good thing to be able to deal with some of these patients uh, that have come back. Uh, the question is, are you still infectious, though? Um, the patients that I've had and we've had together, he may have had some other ones, were able to leave the hospital because they're coming back with symptoms. We're seeing those reports now and have seen those reports. Um, because we know that you can have uh, symptoms or waxing and waning symptoms even after you recover from the virus. Again, are you still contagious? That's a large question we're really trying to answer. We don't think you are. Uh, there was a recent pre-publication out of um, Brunei, which is a country uh, on Borneo. Uh, it's a very small publication, but what they did was they had patients who had recurrent symptoms, and this was an indirect measure, but from 
over 100 contacts and household contacts with those patients that were sick, none of them got ill. So that's indirect evidence that you probably aren't infectious when those things happen. Uh, there's also, we see the reports uh, out of South Korea where people are having recurrent symptoms. Are you reinfected? And so far, based on culture, um, from early reports, they have not been able to culture any infectious virus. So we don't really think that you are infectious at that point. But yeah, we have seen patients uh, come back into the hospital with symptoms, and it's been unfortunate. Uh, but from what I've seen uh, and the patients I've had with Dr. Brown, and he can speak to his, um, his experiences, we have been able to get those patients out of the hospital. Chris, thoughts about that? And have you seen some folks come b bounce back? We call them bounce back. Uh, I, I have. Yeah, yeah. By definition, we call them bounce backs. But yes, I have. And I think, to be honest, not to negate the symptoms or the recurrence or waxing and waning of symptoms, I think a large part of that um, was a fear, meaning that, you know, they really, really did not understand that the aspect of wax and waning and that they may still have some sequela of what um, the disease process caused initially. And a lot of that was just more of an emotional fear. Hey, I mean, is it, getting, is it coming back? Is it gonna come back worse? Can I affect my family? And um, I think in the grand scheme of things, Dana, as well as others, uh, for those patients, we were able to create a team to kind of help them as well as their family emotionally get them back home. Yeah, so important because I think, and this is true really about any virus. You know, I, I had metanumovirus a few years ago and, and uh, bad virus, but you know, you, you get sick and then you think you're getting better and then you get sick again and you're like, what happened? The virus recovery isn't a straight line. It waxes and it wanes, it gets better or worse. And uh, to any pandemic, not that I've lived through a lot, fortunately, uh, but to any great health emergency, there are things that you learn and that it makes you better. And I think that is absolutely true around COVID-19. The thing that's going to be with us the most that I think will transform healthcare in America is telemedicine. I mean, urgency, the urgency with which we have converted to telemedicine visits is remarkable. You know, we usually see about 5,000 to 5,500 patient visits here or with our, within our health system for, outside, for ambulatory visits a day. We went down to about 12 or 1,400 at one point or 1,000. I mean, that's a huge drop. But telemedicine brought it roaring back. And, and today we see between 1,500 and 2,000 telemedicine visits a day and about 5,000 or more televisits, telemedicine visits a week. That is a remarkable story. And many of our patients are so satisfied by that. They don't have to leave work. They don't have to travel from rural Kansas 300 miles for a visit. And yet they can still have a discussion with their physician. So I think telemedicine is a thing that's going to be incredibly important for patients of all ages and all backgrounds. And I, I just can't tell you how impressive it is and how impressed I am by the, our, our teams of folks who have worked on that and the physicians, the nursing staff, and others who have spent so much time trying to make sure they have it right. It is a remarkable story. Um, the other remarkable thing, I think, is how hard people are working to make sure patients stay safe. And the thing about staying safe from COVID-19 is I think that's going to translate into being safer from influenza when you come into hospital or safer from the, the common cold when you come into the hospital from rhinovirus or anything else. And the things that we have done to re-engineer how we do patient care in the inpatient and outpatient worlds and in the operating room, I think a lot of those will help make people even safer. And one of the things we've talked about extensively on this program has been that we're concerned about the people who are at home who are not coming to the hospital because they're afraid they're going to get COVID-19. I would just reiterate, we have worked so hard. We cohort patients with COVID-19. We make sure that they're in one part of the hospital and that they're not in the same part of the hospital as other folks. You're safe when you come here. We really believe that. I think you're safer today than you were a month ago or two months ago because we've worked so hard at those infection control. So I think it's that part's really good news. And, and I think for patients, both telemedicine and some of the new things about patient safety and infection control will be even better than we've, we, than we've ever been. So. Can I Please. The, uh, and the ER, the, the way we built that and expanded the emergency room overnight, Dave Lisbon. Yeah, that, 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 has been a, that has been a remarkable story. And we've, uh, we've tested people who we think have a low risk of being admitted to the hospital and, but have some signs and symptoms of COVID. And thanks to our health system with expanded testing capacity, we feel free to, to, to investigate every complaint uh, to its fullest 
and that's been a great boon. But I will say I've seen what I will call <clears throat> a concerning, I won't give it the disturbing trend yet, which is, in fact, I, I've definitely, I worked last weekend, there are a number of patients who they told me, because I asked them, I said, why did you wait so long to come in? Why did you wait so long? And uh, they were afraid of getting COVID. And, you know, to the community, I would say, again, we're ready to take care of your <clears throat> ongoing medical problem and it, you know especially if you've got diabetes hypertension congestive heart failure um, in any of its variations uh, cancer or chronic kidney disease and you are not feeling well you're feeling body achy sick headache nausea of course fever you should come see us I mean we have the capacity to do multiple things I guess you know walk and chew gum at the same time but more importantly you know, I, I did have to take care of some very sick people this weekend, and I'm almost sure at least half of them, uh, had they come sooner and not had this fear, we wouldn't have had to go through the extraordinary lengths we did to, to try to preserve life. Um, and, it, you know, I love critical care, but if I don't have to do it, I'd rather not do it. Yeah, that's so, a great message. Yeah, I just, you know, we're here. We're, we're ready. We're ready. Chris, are you seeing the same thing on the inpatient side, folks who may have waited too long to get care? Uh, yes, I have. And another thing I've seen, although we do have individuals who probably had symptoms of heart failure, coronary artery disease, diabetes, et cetera, who were afraid to come into, like David said, it was kind of already, I don't want to use the word too late, but definitely it was more advanced than it probably would have been. Um, on the opposite, I have seen a lot of our rule out patients per se who came in with symptoms and they ultimately ended up with a diagnosis of heart failure, with a diagnosis of diabetes, et cetera. So I've kind of seen both sides of it, where people have been so scared and had issues for weeks to months, and then a family member or a friend said, hey, you need to go to the hospital. And by the fact they had to be ruled out, we, we, they did get the diagnosis of those disease processes that David uh, spoke of. So they came in thinking maybe it was COVID-19, but they just waited too long to treat their underlying disease. And, you know, that can be really devastating to folks. And if you're really worried, you think, oh, gosh, there's going to be somebody who's asymptomatic. I'll come in contact. I think we're starting to test every every admission at KU for COVID-19. We're just going to do that in order to make sure that we keep people safe. So anybody who's being admitted. So. So I have a public health question. This is from Gene. And I got to tell you, I'm interested in this, too, because my husband wants a haircut. And his well, question I, is... I need a haircut. It's going to... Uh, you can't tell him really bad. I've threatened to use the scissors on him, but he's seen no so far. <laughs> he wants to know, yesterday he was listening and there was talk about uh, Missouri's going to open up the barbershops. If you wear your gloves, if you wear your mask, am I safe? And he said he's not sure. He wants you to, to tell him... Is Tell him, is it safe? Can okay. you say that? So, you know, that's funny. Last night I was driving down State Line Road and, and on my way home, and on the left side is Missouri, the right side is Kansas, and, and, and on the left side the, the, there was a hair salon. It says, open for business. We're open now. And, and uh, I was like, I don't know. Do I want to get my hair cut or not? Alan, do I want to go get my hair cut? What's, that? What's Wyandotte County thinking? Well, that's that's a tough one. We're still, of course, under a stay at home order until Sunday at midnight. And then we go into our first zone or which we call our red zone. We have red, yellow, green. We actually don't have personal services uh, open and authorized to open in that first red zone. So in, in Kansas City, Kansas, we feel like staying away from environments like that is the safest thing to do until later into this month to see what our data looks like. I, I think Obviously, there's going to be some slight differences in plans across different counties and municipalities, just like there already is across the United States in terms of different states. Um, but we're all of our hair is getting long and, and greasy. And we're, I think the safe thing to do is put these things off as long as we can and, and watch this data closely and, and then make careful decisions as we open things back up. Wear a mask, wear a mask, wear a mask. What else would you say, Dana? Yeah. Wear a mask. You can't maintain six feet of distance when you're getting a haircut. No. Uh, don't touch your face. You know, don't touch your face. Use hand hygiene when you get in there. Use hand hygiene when you leave or when you get into your car. Don't touch your face while you're driving home and not until you get home and, wash and able face. to wash your hands. Don't go out, and this is not just the hair salon, but don't go out if you are sick. You know, protect other people. Um, so I think those, those will be the main messages for that if you have to go out and get your hair cut. We still know you do have to wash your hair. My, my kids would be would, would like to hear that you don't <laughs> because they don't like to. But certainly 
continue to main, uh, maintain otherwise good hygiene. But yeah, if you're going out to those places, those are the simple rules, the pillars that we are trying to continue to reinforce. All right, time for one more question. I know we're running a little over time today, so one more. What do we have? Anybody in from our media out there? Um, this is Nate with the health system. We do have uh, one more question. Uh, do you feel you have a better treatment plan for COVID patients now than you did 30 days ago um, so that you expect better outcomes from patients who are admitted to the hospital? That's a great question. Are we getting better at the disease? Let's see. So, Go ahead, Dave. You know, it's interesting from my standpoint as an emergency physician, <clears throat> You know, this is probably an unprecedented time in terms, and I think Steve uh, would agree, in terms of information, we've probably had more studies published so fast, and rushed so through so fast. I mean, that process is usually arduous and takes time mm -hmm. and proofreading. And it's not that that hasn't been done, but it's been contracted and it's given us a ton of information to consider. And so uh, most of us in our subspecialty areas are, are getting some of our information curated for us by specialty societies. And I, I think what we are looking at, too, is, you know, what treatments work. You know, you've got the hydroxychloroquine debate and azithromycin and what things might help. From our standpoint, we're looking at how can we best predict who might have the disease. So, um, you know, uh, various types of, um, you can call them algorithms, uh, but um, I'm losing the word I'm looking for. But, but strategies to decide who has a higher likelihood pretest probability. So it's been fascinating from that standpoint. I mean, I, I do think, as Steve's alluded to, the hospital's done a fantastic job of cohorting the patients, of creating the safe spaces such that, at least for sure, in the emergency department, we can continue to do the business that we need to do for all the other kinds of uh, care and emergencies, and then create good uh, separate pathways for the patients who might be infected with coronavirus. You know. And I think it's just, it's going to be a um, back to that geeky stuff of virological and um, epidemiological infectious disease challenge to continue to, to confront and find out how what we do you best. think? Where are we? I, you know. And this is your closing statement, too, by the way. Okay. <laughs> well, so, you know, it's very difficult to say. You know, I think our experience here, for one reason or another, in America is different than the experience in China, than different than the experience in in Italy and in other places on some aspects. It's very difficult to determine. You know, our main tenant in medicine is do no harm. So as we have more data coming in out, out now, we saw that hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin were maybe actually doing more harm to our patients. Are we getting therapies and modalities to help improve you if you have COVID? Um, there might be a little bit of glimmer of hope with remdesivir. Uh, we know that that is not a game changer. The principal investigators have said that. You know, the, the data is still very new, but hopefully that will give us something in our armamentarium. Initially, there was saying no steroids. You don't want to use any steroids. We give steroids to people who are really sick sometimes to decrease the inflammation. Well, that paradigm is changing a little bit. We're maybe using it a little bit more. I think the best thing is that we are getting better information. And we, in our experience, um, here in the United States, we are able to um, facilitate some of our treatments because of that and, and learning more and more. And looking at some of the other publications, as Dr. Lisbon pointed out, there have been a lot of publications. Usually those are vetted by peer review. They haven't necessarily been able to do that because we are all wanting more information to make our, our patients better. So I think we are getting more and more information. Um, as far as safety, I think it probably is a lot better than it was 30 days ago, just for the reasons I mentioned. So hopefully that will continue to improve and will continue to provide safe care for our patients. And I would like to say uh, thank you to all the nurses. You know, they are in the patients' rooms all the time, their whole shifts, uh, sometimes two to four patients if they're critically ill, just one very, very sick patient. I'd like to say thank you to my sister who's a nurse up in Madison as well. So thank you for all you guys do. Chris Brown. Thoughts? About um, I, are we better today? I think we are. Um, and I think just in being geeky like David, I guess, uh, I guess the term today, we, we, we're being geeks. But I think it really almost feels like you're an intern or resident now because you have to read so much. You really have to stay up to date. You have to be able to have those educational conversations with your colleagues as well as the patients and the families. Um, so I think we are getting better. Uh, the data is coming out and it's definitely being streamlined as fast as possible so that we can help and take care of our patients. 
And uh, also, I spent quite a bit of time within our cohort of units. Um, and uh, I want to just thank all of those nurses who helped me out a lot, kept me going. And like Dana said, and I, as you said, Dr. Stice, I mean, they are truly in that room, hours upon hours, a lot of exposure. And they're doing that uh, for the betterment of the patient as well as our healthcare system. So I want to give a shout out to everybody on those cohorts. And well, final thoughts. Are we better? Well, <laughs> I don't know if we're better. I think we're we're improving on the public health side in some ways. Of course, we don't do treatment, but we're trying to detect cases and we're trying to track the contacts of those folks. And then we're trying to convince people to change their behaviors long term to contain this pandemic. I think we need to keep paying attention to health inequity. We need to keep paying attention to social determinants of health out there in the world. And I think if we can keep working together in partnership to address some of the challenges that that our communities and some of the diverse pockets in our communities face we'll have better outcomes and we'll feel like we we did some of the important things we should be doing all the time to preserve health and and eventually reach the equity we want to see in communities yeah so true well you know i think uh, i'm going to take a stab at this i actually think we're much better than we were a month ago and I think we've learned so much about the disease. We've learned new ways to do different things around mechanical ventilation. Uh, not new, but how to apply it to COVID-19. We've gotten smarter about that. We've gotten a lot smarter about the role of anticoagulation in, in COVID-19 because there's a very clear path of COVID-19 with microthrombosis, small blood clots we have to address. The issue of steroids in COVID-19 and the issue of when you could or couldn't use other medications. I, I do think we're a lot smarter off and I think we're seeing some better outcomes because of it. Um, we got a long ways to go, but the information is coming out fast and furious. Um, I want to tell a story about somebody who's kind of a goofball who Googled something and maybe have not come up with the right information. So a few days ago, I was thinking that uh, Nurses Day was May 12th, and I had Googled it, and it said May 12th. I was right. It's in Great Britain that it's May 12th. <laughs> in the United States, it's today. You know, one of the untold stories, I think, is of, as nurses of family. Uh, because our patients don't have visitors, the nursing staff becomes the family. And even on the inpatient and the outpatient side, there's so much fear and so many questions about it. The nursing staff are the ones who are really encountering that on a moment-to-moment -moment basis and living it with our patients. They are the family for our folks that are here. They're the family for our outpatients who haven't been able to come in and see their physicians. I just, when you look at who's going to help us survive this crisis, as with many crises. It's the nursing staff that, that bears so much of the load. Thank you very much for all that you do. Thanks to all our listeners. We'll see you tomorrow.